All right, we are continuing Mummy Week here in the month of October. Today we are looking at 1959's The Mummy from Hammer Productions in the UK. Or, as I think of these movies, the ones with Grand Moff Tarkin and Count Dooku. Um, so, I mentioned this a little bit in my, my part one. This is part two of seven, by the way, so if you haven't seen part one, check that out. But I mentioned in my part one that, supposedly, according to everything online, this movie draws most of its content from the sequels to Universal's Mummy film, which focuses on, on a different mummy. So the names are different, but a lot of the things that happen, a lot of the events, a lot of the concepts still seem pretty similar to me. So I don't know all about all that. The names are different. I'll give them that. But a lot of the rest of it is very similar. So um, we have the princess is named Ananka in this film. The mummy is named Karis. And the god that causes all the problems is named Karnak. A little confusing to have Karis and Karnak. Um, I had to go back a couple times and double check and make sure I was picking up the right pieces of information for the right character. Those could have been a little bit different, but that's that's a pretty small nit nitpick. Um, so we've got a father and son and uncle. So this trio of British archaeologists studying in Egypt and uh, the father finds in the tomb of Ananka the scroll of life. The son has got a damaged leg so he's not able to go in. So the uncle, the father's brother, goes out to tell the son that they found the tomb. While alone in the tomb, the father reads from the scroll of life and brings the mummy back to life. So very similar to how the mummy comes back to life and the other versions that I'm familiar with. Somebody reads something <laughs> and, and the mummy comes back. Uh, so he goes mad, essentially. Uh, then we have a time jump, like we have in a lot of these movies. Um, and then, apparently I was bored because I started looking up some trivia because <laughs> I wrote down that this uh, movie was born from an agreement that Hammer Productions had with Universal. So for a while, you know, Universal is making these movies about characters that are in the public domain, but they are trademarking certain elements about the characters like for Frankenstein example they couldn't trademark the character but they could trademark their appearance of the character with the prosthetics and the hair and the electrodes and things like that so when Hammer made their Frankenstein film it had to look visually very different but at some point the two studios had some kind of agreement so Hammer started redoing a lot of what Universal did in their own vein but they didn't have to distance themselves quite so much every time they did that. So, um, I think, I don't know, I think it was more interesting, and granted, I've only, at this point, I'm recording these out of order, so at this point I've only seen the Frankenstein ones, um, but I think it's more interesting when you have to be different, because that forces you to be creative and figure out a way around the problem it's the same kind of thing that I think, while I don't necessarily agree with the censorship of art, I think that having censorship rules in place can lead to more creative tellings of stories and more creative ways of telling stories in some cases. And so, while it's probably easier to just be like, yeah, you can just use all of our stuff, that's fine, go ahead. I think it's more of a creative challenge and therefore more interesting for me to see. It's like, okay, we want to do a mummy movie, but we can't do this, 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 or this. How do we work around that? What else can we do? And then we get a new idea. So, I don't know. It, 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 not that it's a knock against this movie, that they're using the resources at their disposal, but um, it just kind of makes me wonder, like, what other version of a mummy might we have gotten if they couldn't just use plot lines and characters and story arcs from the Universal films. So, weird tangent. I apologize. Let's move on. Um, so, in both the Universal and the Hammer films, at some point we get a flashback to 
the actual events that lead to the curse. Back in ancient Egypt with the character that becomes the mummy and their love interest and blah blah blah. In this movie, it lasts very, very long. I didn't really pick up or notice how much time it took in the Universal film, but in the Hammer film, it takes like 15 minutes just for the flashback. And it's all being narrated by Grand Moff Tarkin. I need to look up that actor's name because it's bugging me that I can't remember it. Um, but uh, it lasts a really long time. And it was one of those things where the flashback started and I kind of tuned out a little bit. I was like, okay, I know basically what's about to happen here. But I expected it to last like a couple minutes. And then at one point I was just like, how long has this been going? And then I didn't want to miss any details, so I actually went back and I rewatched it again because I know that sometimes I can lose attention and I try to address that when I can. Um, so again, it's not really a knock or anything like that. It's just, I feel like you're making a mummy movie. People kind of understand what mummies are by this point. This is what year? 1959. And you're pretty open about taking the concepts from other movies. So it's like, people aren't going to be surprised about what happens in that flashback. So if you're going to make a flashback last that long, I kind of almost wonder why you don't start the movie with that. Why make it a flashback? Why not just go in chronological order? I guess, I don't know. I wasn't a movie goer in 1959. Maybe that would have confused audiences if they see things happening in ancient Egypt. And they're like, well, I thought this was going to be a more modern movie, like the other picture that we saw. So maybe there was a reason for it. But I feel like nowadays audiences kind of understand that if we're going to go see a movie that has an element that takes place in the past, we're probably going to see that thing first and then jump forward. That seems to be more common nowadays. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, again, not a knock, not a negative, just... Sometimes I just wonder why people make the choices that they made, even if I don't think it's a bad choice. So I'm like, that's not the choice that I would have made. I wonder if there's a reason that they did that. What's the reason that I would do it the way I would do it, right? It's just, I think it's good to question things, even if you don't disagree with them. All right, so we get a uh, much longer flashback. So as I said, the high priest Karis is in love with the high priestess, Ananka, but she's committed to the god Karnak. So after Ananka died, Karis tries to revive her using the Scroll of Life. For this, he was killed and cursed. The tongue was cut from his mouth, and he was mummified alive. So all that seems pretty similar to the other, the 1932 version uh, and the 1999 version that I've seen before. So pretty similar setup, catalyst whatever you want to call it. Um, we've got Isabel in this film is the main character's love interest who, again, I kind of I tend to miss some of these things, especially as things are revealed later in the movie. But in the, um, in the 1999 version, what's her name? What's the woman's name? Oh, good. Evie? I think it's Evie. Um, she's revealed to be, like, the descendant of an ox and a moon or, or something like that. I think that's revealed in the second one. I and mean, in the first one, it's just that, I don't know, he reminds, or she reminds Imhotep of her, or maybe he just needs a woman to take the place. I, that, that, all, that whole segment of this story always is a little bit cloudy to me. Like, what exactly do they need the woman for? Um... And in this one, again, it's, it's, I believe, if I'm not confusing this with other ones, she's got a resemblance. Isabel has a resemblance to Ananka. I think they're both played by the same actress. And so she's able to, like, command the mummy if her hair is done in a certain way. Um, but I can't remember if he needs her body or her soul or what, but that element of the mummy needs the woman for something who just so happens to be the love interest of the main character that's here at play also i just i'm always fuzzy on the details about those things i don't know why 
I don't know. Maybe I just don't find that part of the story very interesting. So, um, there's this, there's a, there's a servant of Karis in this movie. Nope. A servant of Karnak. See? I get the names confused. There's a servant of Karnak who is using Karis to exact revenge on these archaeologists that disturbed this tomb. So basically, there's the three people, the, the son, the father, and the uncle, and the servant, whose name I didn't write down and I don't remember, he is basically using the mummy to kill all of these people. But at one point, the mummy is in the house to kill I can't, uh, the uncle, I think, or maybe, maybe it's even earlier. I don't know, but at some point, um, he's in the same house as the son. And he doesn't kill him. And maybe I'm misremembering here. Maybe he tried and he failed. But I wrote down, why not kill John when he... Oh, no! I'm sorry. Okay, so he does... The mummy tries and fails to kill the son, John, while he's at the house to kill the uncle. He succeeds in killing the uncle, but John fights him off and he escapes. But then John, the son, comes to the house where this servant of Karnak lives and where the mummy is. And the servant is just pleasant to him. They kind of get into a spat about, you're an archaeologist. All you do is desecrate tombs and steal things that aren't yours to put on display for other people. And I think that's probably the most interesting part of this movie, is that it raises those questions and it, it brings that up, which most mummy movies gloss over if they mention it all. Um... But he's in their house, and he, like, shows them around, and they're talking, and they're chatting, and blah, 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 and no one else is there. The mummy's there. And then he leaves. And then he goes in, and he gets the mummy out of hiding, and he's like, oh, you gotta go back and kill him. Don't fail this time. And it's like, why didn't you kill him while he was there? He literally came to you, and you did. <laughs> so that was a little bit weird. And then I wrote, or why didn't you kill all of them? at the original gravesite, because that servant was there when they dug up the tomb, and he told them not to, he warned them about the curse, he said that there would be consequences, and he's there, and then he just leaves? I'm like, is it because there were a bunch of other people there that were part of the party, and so he needed to wait until he could get them alone? I, I don't know. It, it's very weird uh, process of killing the people that they want to kill and not taking all the opportunities that they get for it. Um, at one point, towards the end, I just wrote, The Mummy looks good, though. So, as I mentioned in the 1931 version, most of the time that Imhotep is walking around, he's just a guy. It's just Boris Karloff. And, you know, he's got kind of a creepy look to him, but he's just a guy. Whereas in this film, he does a lot more walking and moving around as the mummy in mummy bandages, right? And it looks pretty good. Again, the Hammer films, they're in color, while the old Universal ones are in black and white. So it's a little bit more visually interesting. So I do think this has a really good look to The Mummy. And then I just put that it ends abruptly. Of course, I didn't help myself out and talk about how it ended abruptly. So I don't remember how they defeat The Mummy. But I uh, feel like it has something to do with a bog because there's a bog that they keep showing and referencing throughout the film. Um, my fridge is making noises. So yeah, I, I, I don't even remember how it ends. I just watched it yesterday and I don't remember how it ends because it, 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 just, it just ends and then it's over and then it's done. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the mummy has it's killed the dead and the uncle the son is still alive there's a couple other people there's like a police inspector and another policeman and then like a town drunk that's helping them out but you know oh, did i write is this where i wrote about oh yeah i missed this note i wrote uh gun has failed twice better try it again because there are two separate times where the son 
shoots the mummy and he knows that he hit him. He sees that he hit him and then he sees that it has no effect. And then their big plan when they know the mummy is coming is everybody have guns. And it's just like, you know, that doesn't work. Try something else. Try fire. Try electricity. Try crushing it. Nope. Let's try guns again. Uh, so they've got all these people out with guns. I don't remember exactly what happens, but the mummy gets Isabel. And I think she, like, faints or something. Uh, but he's, he's carrying her away. And so they're all like, don't shoot, you might hit her. And so eventually she wakes up. And she is able to use her hair trick to command him. And she tells him to put her down. And they're in this bog. And so he puts her down and she gets away from him. And so they all shoot at him and he falls down in the bog. And... I don't know if it ends there or if there, there might be one more short scene afterwards, but it ends pretty quickly. And, you know, it's like he was in that bog before when he was being transported in a crate and the crate, the whole crate fell in and then he just walked out of it. So I don't know why they all think, I guess, I don't know. Do they know that? I feel like they would figure that out. They would piece that together. But they all seem pretty satisfied that he's dead. So I don't know if... Um, the Hammer Mummy sequels pick up... Because the Universal ones, they just restart. They don't follow the original one. I don't know if the Hammer ones do that also. I'll have to check those out at some point. Because I feel like he's just going to walk up on out of that bar. But maybe I'm forgetting something. I don't want to be too harsh on something that I don't remember clearly. So I'm going to stop it there. Those are my thoughts on... What year was this? 1959's The Mummy from Hammer Productions. Let me know if... You have any thoughts, but that's all that I have to say. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day. Hey everybody, Sam Tom here. Just wanted to let you know that I have two channels. If you're watching my music content, I also have a movie channel where I talk about movies and TV shows. If you're watching my movie content, I have a music channel where I do song covers, instrument demos, things like that. So feel free to check that out. Obviously, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that YouTube stuff. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.